episode seven of For the Love of the Game interview series. This is an interview series that brings on players, coaches, and other professionals in the sports industry. For episode seven, I'm very excited to have the head coach of the Fairfield University men's basketball program, Jay Young. How you doing, Jay? I'm great, Pete. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. I mean, we're, we're right now we're in the middle of July. Um, still a lot of action going on in terms of transfer portal things, and obviously practice has started. So I just want to get your general thoughts so far on this version of the stags that we're going to see and what have been some some takeaways early here in practice, even though, you know, it's not a full roster yet. Right. Yeah, I think it's still a work in progress. We, we've started workouts. Uh, Muin is still in uh, Cameroon. Uh, so we really haven't had a full roster, but we've been doing a lot of individual stuff, a lot of individual offensive stuff with uh, the assistant coaches. Haven't done a ton of contact yet, Pete. Um, you know, Bryson Goodine has been clear to do non-contact stuff. He looks great, but we're just kind of going slow with him. So for the first couple of weeks, first two, three weeks here, we've just been doing a ton of shooting, uh, a lot of individual instruction. And uh, so far, I've been really happy with the group. When you look at the roster, tons of new guys come in, obviously lost a couple of players who are key contributors. What could you say about the current market? Certainly looking for front court help. That's no secret. Uh, we lost Supreme. We lost Chris uh, and Makai all to the transfer portal. So we went from having a ton of depth, really, at the five position, probably the most in the league, uh, to, to you know trying to restock that. So we're looking for a couple of guys now to certainly play in the front court. Uh, we've been really uh, careful with it. Uh, didn't want to have kind of an emotional reaction to guys leaving and want to make sure we got the right pieces. So we we have had some guys in, get some guys in here and, and get them ready for that trip for Costa Rica that we're taking in the middle of August. So under your your lead, Fairfield is, is no stranger to bringing in players from bigger programs. Bryson Goodine coming from Providence, uh, you know, before that he was at Syracuse. You got Jake Wojcik from from Richmond, another good program in their own right. Nowadays, right, you got every single guy I'm sure that walks in the door is trying to look for NIL. So it's not as easy as when those guys were transferring. How how have you and your staff uh, tried to adjust? Well, I think every school at our level is trying to figure out where they fit in in this new landscape. And we've got a great athletic director, great staff. Uh, great administration, I should say, and they're very cognizant of the fact that this is uh, kind of a new era in college basketball, and we've been working hard uh, to, you know, start a collective. We've partnered with a company called Yoke already, uh, but, you know, we're, we're working to, to kind of figure out where we belong in that landscape and, and how, what that means for Fairfield University, but we all understand how necessary it is to compete. Uh, in today's climate and uh you know we're, we're planning on being very competitive in that market jay in terms of the job at fairfield the facilities are unquestionably the best in the mac when they, when this was getting started and, and really could you talk about the excitement level obviously one year down in, in leo d mahoney arena you had some great um, turnouts in a lot of games this year, including some local rivalry games. Yale came to the building. Sacred Heart came to the building. How much added pressure do you do you almost feel now that you have all these facilities? Well, you know, I think pressure is a privilege. Uh, there's pressure every game for that coaches it. You know, um, in Division One, it coaches anywhere. I felt pressure when I was a Division Two head coach. I think, uh, you know. Uh, for us, the, the building, you know, I, I think it's one of the nicest buildings in the entire country at any level. Uh, they, they just did everything right. I say this all the time that there's always someone who complains about something, and this is the one thing that no one's actually complained about anything about Mahoney. So it's a tribute to uh, all the boosters who put in, you know, money for, for this building to be built, our administration who's so committed to get it done. But I'll tell you, Pete, I don't know if I ever felt more pressure than that first game against St. Peter's coaching. Um, I didn't want to be the guy who lost the uh, opening game in, in Mahoney. Uh, the last building was up for like 70-something years, and I, and I didn't want to be the guy 
who, you know, long after I was gone, uh, was the guy who lost the, the, the game in that building. So I, I felt a ton of pressure that that first game against St. Peter's, and luckily we won. It was a big relief when that game was over because there was so much build up to that game. Uh, and then, you know, you just kind of coach after that. But, uh, you know, we're blessed to have that that beautiful uh, facility and, and the fans, the community came out and gave us just such tremendous support this year. Jay, we're going to talk about a little bit about the schedule, but before that, you guys have a trip coming to Costa Rica where you're going to play a couple of games, spend, I think, about a week there. Can you talk about the makings of that trip and, and why Costa Rica? Well, I did a couple of them, Pete, when I was at Stony Brook, a couple of these international trips, and they're tremendous. They they, they really are. Uh, I was fortunate enough, my first year at Stony Brook, we went to Dublin, London, Paris, and then four years later, Munich, uh, Rome, Florence, and Venice, so amazing cities. Uh, and I was supposed to go to, Sp to Spain right before I took the job here uh, at Fairfield, and unfortunately, I couldn't make that trip. But, but um, yeah, they, they're just a, a great opportunity for our guys who some of them have never traveled outside the country. And more importantly, uh, you get 10 practices and a chance to uh, – you know, really get together and bond on a, on a great trip. My thoughts about Costa Rica was one, it, it, it was just a little different. It was a little shorter than going over to Europe. Uh, if we had taken a, like a two week trip, which they can sometimes be, it would have brought us right up to almost the start of classes where I felt it was important for the guys to get home for, you know, a week or so, Pete. So the Costa Rica trip uh, came to our attention and, I just thought it'd be a great, relaxed, kind of relaxed way for us to end the summer. We're going to do some really neat things over there, play three games. We're going to go to an orphanage one day and volunteer our time there. So I thought it was going to be a really good experience. Chris Casey, uh, my assistant, had when he was the head coach at Niagara, went uh, to Costa Rica and raved about it. Uh, so we just thought it all made sense, really, quite honestly, and uh, really looking forward to it, uh, to get over there and, and uh, get our guys together and have some – fun and play some basketball too as of right now all the bodies that are on campus all the players i mean we talked about maroof um you know he's still in africa right now but everybody that's that's there on campus will everybody be making the trip uh to, to costa rica yeah. yes everybody will be making it yep okay great and this is the stag's first trip international trip since they went to uh 2017 they went to italy and i think a couple years before that they went to italy as well uh under sydney johnson so um Plenty to look forward there. You guys going to spend some days doing different, like, activities, you know? Going yeah, I think, I mean, we were talking about the other day, Coach Dewar, Brian Dewar's been really uh, doing a great job kind of organizing uh, the details of the trip. So I think one day we've got, like, a zip lining thing, and uh, we've got a whitewater rafting trip, which should be fun. And uh, we're going to go to, the, I guess, this well-known crocodile bridge, right, uh, on, on one of the days. So sounds like a really uh, – a great trip for our guys. Jay, you've been here, been at Fairfield for a couple of years. These assistants, you know, you alluded to a couple of them here, um, you know, with Brian and, you know, can you talk about them and, and really the culture that they've helped you build? And then as well, you added a new director of basketball operations this year, Matt Knezovich. So can you talk about this staff? I've got a great staff. Um, you know, uh, Chris Casey was a head coach in this league. I've known Chris for, over 30 years when we have both young division three assistants. Uh, and, and Chris is a fantastic coach. He's, he's a better person, does a great job with our guys. Uh, Brian, I recruited to play for us at Stony Brook. Uh, you know, I always thought he was going to be uh, a great coach. He had such a good IQ as a player and that's just kind of, you know, continued as he, as I've watched him on his coaching journey, he was at, Director of Ops when I was at Stony Brook, we took him to Rutgers. Coach Peichel took him to Rutgers, and uh, he just excelled in that position. And he was just such a natural for me to really my first hire when I got the job at Fairfield, and uh, he's done a great job. Uh, I lost Pat Sellers uh, two years ago to uh, Central Connecticut to a head coaching job, which is an open, awesome uh, opportunity for Pat. I had James Johns. James has been great. Um, you know, uh, been a really good uh, uh, addition to our staff. 
obviously we have a son on the team and and just his connections in the in the tri-state area really helped us and then i just added matt matt i knew from first man when i was at rutgers and he was an assistant at the mcduffie school uh in springfield and we recruited uh, one of his players got to know him always kind of kept in contact with him and uh, when this position uh opened up with jesus cruz going back to play professionally uh, matt reached out and uh, he's he's only been on the job for a couple of weeks but i threw him right in the middle of uh camp and he's uh he's done a great job with it so i'm really fortunate to have such a uh, a good uh, a great staff and i always say like you know if i if i had a son these would i want uh, them to play for any one of these guys i certainly would let's go back to 2016. you guys end up going to the ncaa tournament with stony brook uh under steve peichel play kentucky in the first round ultimately um, you know, Steve takes the job at Rutgers. You follow him there. Could you talk about getting that experience as an assistant and how valuable that has been in in really your development as a coach, Jay? Yeah, uh, you know, Steve was as uh, we're, we're still very close, but it, you know, he was my boss. But we were really, uh, you know, more friends, Pete, than anything else. And I said, when you get to work for uh, a guy every day that you consider a close friend is pretty special. Steve, uh, the best thing he ever did is empower me and let me do a lot. Uh, he had great trust in me, uh, and I really always appreciated how much responsibility he gave to me. Let me really grow as a coach. Uh, so when we, you know, it, it was a kind of a weird story. We we play Kentucky and we lose to Kentucky in the first round of the NCAA tournament. And, you know, there's a lot of people around us, you know, people on the trip and that type of thing. And he just texted me and said, hey, let's grab a coffee. Next morning we grabbed the coffee and he said, hey, uh, you know, we've got a couple opportunities uh, for an interview at Rutgers. There was another job that he was going to interview for. I don't know if anything's going to come of it, but I'd love you to come with me and if, if, it, if it happens. And I said, you know, great. And, you know, we didn't really talk details. I didn't really, and I don't know why looking back, like when you're going in, what's, you know, what, what, and the next day we get off the plane on, a, I think it was a Saturday night or Sunday. I'm just kind of hanging out by myself at my condo and my phone starts blowing up and it's everybody saying, Pete, uh, Steve just took the, the Rutgers job. And, you know, as being part of the media, it kind of gets to the media before it gets to anyone else. Yeah. Um, so he hadn't even called me. I don't even think he called his wife. She, she kind of read about it. So, uh, you know, we talked later in the day and, uh, you know, I ended up going to Rutgers with him and it, uh, it was an unbelievable experience coached in what I thought was the best league in the country, uh, in the big 10 and, you know, uh, watch Steve start to build that program just like he did at Stony Brook. So it took a lot of le lessons from that. And uh, really consider those Rutgers years as, as really three of the better years of my coaching because of the environment that we were in every night and, and everything that I learned. So this past season, an exhibition game, you guys travel to New Brunswick. You end up playing mm -hmm. Rutgers, you know, as part of an exhibition game, honoring Eric Legrand and his foundation, former Rutgers football player. What was the... You know, can you talk about the process of scheduling that? And, and did it just make too much sense that you, that you couldn't turn it down, I would imagine, right? Well, it wasn't even about to turn it down. We, Steve and I were sitting next to each other on the baseline in some AAU tournament, I think in Indianapolis in the spring. And we just started talking about exhibitions. You know, and, uh, you know, he said, uh, you know, what, what do you think we could play each other in like an exhibition to – uh, and I said, yeah, you, you know, we did the charity games uh, when, when against St. John's, like when I was there, uh, I think it was for all the hurricanes at the time. I, I can't even really remember what it was for, but um, I said, yeah, I mean, like it, it just, this would be great. We get to put on the uniforms, turn the lights on. We had kind of a, a, a couple new guys and he, he thought the same thing. And, you know, the foundation part of it was the easy part. You know, I mean, and the charity was with Eric and everything that he's met to Rutgers University. So we just, it just kind of organically happened from this conversation that we had watching an AAU game in uh, April. And then we just kind of took it from there and our two compliance departments worked through all the 
litigation and the stuff that needed to be done. And uh, it was a great day. It was a lot of fun. It was cool to be back there. I think my wife uh, had more fun than I did because she got to see all our old friends and hung out with Steve's wife during the game. So it, it was a really cool experience for a great fun, uh, a great cause. When you look at, you know, look ahead to this upcoming season, last year you guys had a couple of really um, eye-opening games on, on the non-conference, going to play at Wake Forest um, to kick things off of the actual non-conference slate after the Rutgers game, uh, playing Xavier after making the trip up to New Hampshire. Uh, you guys are traveling all over. Look to this year, you playing at URI, you got a visit to Boston College, you know, two competitive programs. How excited are you for them? And, and was it really a, an emphasis to, again, schedule a couple of, of bigger opponents? Yeah, we're always looking to have those games when we always will have those games on our schedule. Um, you know, we and Pete, we try to do them uh, regionally if we can. First of all, to you know, for a fiscal standpoint, it's a lot less expensive than jumping on a plane and, and we can be back the night after the game and get the guys back for class. So it makes just sense to do it regionally if you can we tried last year we just couldn't find the games that matched up and matched up with our open dates we were fortunate this year to get a couple of regional teams that that we could play and you know they're, they're difficult games both those teams are very well coached but uh, i think it's exciting for our guys exciting for our fans and the difference is now hopefully some of the fairfield sag fans can come out and watch those games where you know obviously going to you know, Wake Forest or Xavier is difficult for them to do. But we'll always have those games on our schedule. They're attractive for so many reasons. And and our guys love playing them. Jay, after, you know, the Wake Forest and all a couple of those games I just mentioned, you guys were a part of an MT. You went down to, to Georgia, Savannah. I played in that. Now this coming season, you'll also be a part of one in, in you know, Drexel, going to Drexel. Can you talk about that and, and the competitiveness and, and how good is that going to be of a test to see where your team is at at that stage in the non-conference. Yeah, it'll be a very good test. I think Drexel is one of the few teams, Pete, that did not lose anyone to the portal in the entire country, and it's a small number. And uh, I remember doing the scout for that game uh, before it got canceled last year because of COVID. So we went up, I want to say right to, if I remember right, right to the day before or two days before, so we were pretty well prepared for that game. And then unfortunately they got hit with a bout of COVID and had to cancel. So I can remember how good that team was and what a test it was going to be for at home. Now we're going to go on the road and, and play in that tournament. Um, so that'll be a really, really good test. I don't know a ton about Queens right now. I know they're very well coached. I've watched a little film on them, but they're athletic and, and they play really hard. So, um, you know, we've got a really strong test again to start our season. You also look at some of the local rivalry games. Again, you'll be re making return games. So at Sacred Heart this year, uh, going to the Pitt Center uh, right across town, and then also making the trip, the short trek up to New Haven. Talk about those rivalry games and how fun is it to, to play against Coach Latina and Coach Jones? Yeah, th so the Sacred Heart game has been a great game. Um, we've been fortunate enough to win two games and, last year at the buzzer to kind of, yeah. you know, steal one. And, and, but both games, Pete, have been great atmospheres uh, for both of us. We started the series off at Sacred Heart. Uh, that was sold out. We all, I, I believe we had a sell out last year at Mahoney. So both of those have been really exciting games. And I think anytime you're creating, you know, a little buzz in November with a non-conference game, uh, it, it's great for our guys, great, great for the region. So uh, it's been, that game has been, uh, really well received by everybody uh the yale game just we started that series last year um you know obviously uh coach jones does an incredible job he's got a really good program we know how good they they are um so that'll be another big test for us but all those games make sense for us they're easy trips and uh i think it generates some interest in your non-conference schedule jay obviously we have a long ways to go until atlantic city next year but you know, things didn't end the way you wanted to, you know, last year against St. Peter's um, in that opening round game. Look back in 2021, you guys made a great run to the finals. You were one game away, you know, 40 minutes away from making the program's first NCAA tournament in since 90, uh, 97, 98, somewhere, right? One of those, one of those years. Uh, could you talk about that 21 team and really 
you know, how much, how, how great was that for the program in terms of building excitement and how, how important is it going to be to get back to that level this year? Right. That 21 year P was such a strange year. Cause that was COVID right That We were smack in the middle of it. And, uh, I think we had eight new guys on the team that year. And when you have eight, nine new guys, you don't have a summer to prepare. We got back in September and I think two or three of the guys, the first time they were ever on our campus was, you know, when they, when they went to school for the first time, which is, you know, completely unusual. They no visits, no unofficial visits. They just kind of saw it uh, over a Zoom call and a presentation we put together. And then, like a lot of programs, we just got smacked with COVID issues. I mean, we we were just, uh, you know, if it wasn't us, it was another team, and we would have to get shut down, and we just had so many stops and goes. Uh, I just thought we had no rhythm our first in the non-conference. I think we started off 0-6 or something like that. It was crazy. And we were losing these close games, but we weren't practicing at all. That was the biggest thing. So finally, uh, more by everybody having COVID, <laughs> you know, we, we everybody kind of had COVID and got through it that we weren't, uh, I think the whole team had it at one point, including all the coaches, that we started to practice. And uh, we got into a pretty good rhythm. I thought we were playing really good basketball, started to play good basketball the second half of the season, a lot more consistent. Uh, Woj was having a really good second half for us. Uh, and then we just kind of got into a good rhythm where when we got on that bus um, to go down to Atlantic City, I felt pretty good about us. I really did. I, I felt we were we were we were playing well. Uh, we had guys who kind of knew their role. Now, I didn't know what that was, was going to mean in Atlantic City. Uh, but the other part of it Pete, was our defense was really starting to come around. That was the one part. That, that second half. So I thought our defense kind of carried us. Uh, we made enough threes to kind of beat, win some close games and unfortunately just ran out of steam against a, a very, very talented Iona team. Um, and, you know, you've done a lot of shuffling around this offseason, losing, again, you said the, the, the front court at times, basically your whole entire starting lineup from last year, um, including a guy like TJ Long, who obviously – you know, had a lot of great moments for the Stags in his two years. When you look at this team next year, right, it's going to be a big priority, Jay, to get the three-point shooting up. In what ways, in terms of the personnel so far, are you excited for that aspect of the game to improve? Well, I guess I look at it, Pete, as it can't get much worse than we shot the three last year. We were, we were really, uh, you know, we, we really struggled in that area. Um, in the in the summer here now, uh, Caleb Fields has played really well, uh, has shot it very very well. Uh, Bryson Goodine was a big loss for us last year. Um, you know he was just starting to come around when he hurt his knee, uh, and he's back now. So I think he'll he'll shoot the ball well for us. Uh, Jalen Leach looks better. He looks to have, he was just coming off his injury, so he looks to have a little more pop in him. Mike Rogan is a kid we redshirted who could really really shoot it. Uh, Louis Bleasmore, transfer from St. Peter, from I'm sorry, St. Joe's, yep. uh, is has shot it well. So I think we've got enough uh, pieces there to shoot the ball better. And honestly, you know, it, last year, and I've gone back and I've looked at almost every game now. I, I thought for the most part we took good shots, uh, and especially from three. We just had a, a bad year for whatever reason shooting the basketball. And uh, I hope that's certainly uh, in the rearview mirror. And we've got some guys, I think, this year who can make some shots. Jay, when you look across the MAC landscape so far to, you know, the average observer, you know, there's a lot of obscurity, you know, a lot of roster turnover, just like your roster. Rick Pitino leaves the conference. Iona has a new regime now. You know, Iona has obviously been the class of the league, you know, basically almost for the last decade essentially is it has the Mac never been this wide open I mean it was for times at, you know last year it felt like it was wide open at times before Iona made their huge run but this coming season with Iona not with Rick Pitino a Hall of Fame coach does that open things up for, for a team like Fairfield yeah I, I would agree with that um 
I mean, the, picking a preseason favorite right now uh, in our league is probably the toughest job that you can do. Obviously, I think Ryder uh, retained some guys and, and brought back a talented roster, but you know, the the first, second, and third team, there's one player returning out of that that group. So it's it's a conference. I just don't think anybody knows enough. I, I you know, I'm looking at my own team and until we kind of get together and and uh, start practicing on a regular basis and even get back to school, I, I don't even know if coaches know that much about their own teams right now uh, and what they've got. So it'll be certainly an interesting year, and I think every coach feels the same way that this thing is wide open right now. That includes three other schools, MAC schools, with with new head coaches. Um, so not only roster turnover, but you know a couple of new head coaches in the mix as well. Um, during the off season, obviously, if you're a hoops junkie uh, like you are, Jay, you you easily look toward the NBA. I'm sure. Can you talk about watching the NBA playoffs? I know you're a big Celtics fan. Didn't end the way you wanted it to, but what could you say about really the the entire sample of the playoffs this year and and really just the talent that was on display and you know whether it was from teams like Boston or obviously Denver? Yeah, my Celtics came up a little short, Pete, um, and it'll be interesting to see. I, I was a huge Marcus Smart fan, so I'm going to miss him. I thought he was kind of the uh, the glue in, in the in the uh, you know, really what what made them go. They have a lot of talent, but I, I like the way that he kind of, I thought without him, uh, he, he was kind of the heart and soul of, of the Celtics. But I don't watch a lot of NBA. I'm, I'm sure I'm like most college coaches. You're so enamored. You're so uh, just focused on your next opponent or watching film with yourself that you, you really don't watch anything other than your league and yourself during the season. So, I don't even watch that much other that much college basketball besides uh, you know who your next opponent is. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't uh, it gives you time to to uh, you know watch the NBA. I mean the player the, the level of play there and the shot making and and the talent of these guys is just incredible. You watch a guy like Jokic at, at his size and the way he passes the ball and and. You know that wasn't uh, that wasn't around 20 years ago in the NBA. So these guys are just so talented. And actually, I've I've really enjoyed a lot of the summer league stuff. I I love watching the the, the names of college basketball kind of compete during the summer and watching some of those guys that you that you kind of see and uh, getting their chance to play uh, for the first time with an NBA uniform on. That's that's been kind of cool too to watch. And how about Patrick Gardner? You know, coming from the MAC, playing for Miami. I saw the other day he had a double-digit um, output. What could you say about his game? And really, you know, the you know, kind of looking at it from the outside, Miami's developed a lot of undrafted players. Patrick Gardner is an undrafted player. Right. How tough was it to guard Patrick Gardner? And did this kid just come out of you know left field? Yeah, it's an incredible story. It's a, it's a little bit like the Duncan Robinson story, who started at Division three, then went to Michigan when I was at Rutgers. We played against Duncan and. Uh, you know, Miami certainly values shooting, and that's one thing that Patrick can do. And he's uh, at his size and his ability to shoot the ball, pass the ball. It's really what the NBA has become. Uh, so it was really cool to watch him, uh, a guy from the MAC out there playing and playing well. I wasn't surprised. I thought offensively for sure he's going to be a good fit. It's it probably going to be a matter of who he can cover. But, um, you know, it was really cool to see. But, but his talent – and his skill level certainly translates to that level, to that uh, that level. Jay, recently you were on um, Jeff Goodman's show. A couple other mid-major coaches were on there. Obviously, the main topic is NIL, transfer portal. You know, ideas are getting floated around about how do we make this system fair across the board. You know, you as a mid-major coach, right, what could you say about the current landscape and really there's an idea like, I don't know, such as a salary cap or, or some type of restriction on NIL makes sense to you? I think, Pete, it, it, the way the climate is now that something's got to give. Um, you know, even at the high major level, uh, schools are, are struggling with NIL. Um, so the original idea that, that players should benefit, uh, 
offer their name, image, and likeness if you sell your uniform in the bookstore, uh, should you get a piece of the sales? And I, I don't, and that type of thing, I don't think anybody had any arguments with that. We all thought that that was a good idea, but it's just kind of morphed into this thing, kind of pay for play now. And, uh, you know, the schools with the big collectives, the schools with the deeper pockets are, are going to get the best players. Um, so I, I think that, that, you know, I look at a guy like that, Jameel Warney, that great player, was a great player for us at Stony Brook, mm -hmm. you know, and the legacy that he has there and his uniforms retired. And I still say he could go back and run for mayor and probably win in a landslide. You know, you wonder if that's just all gone now. Uh, and we, we kept so many of those great uh, players together when I was at Stony Brook. You wonder if that can be done again at the mid-major level. So we're trying to figure out, every other mid-major team is, is trying to figure out. I think the high majors who don't have the big collectives are trying to figure it out. So I don't have the answers, Pete. I just know that uh, I worry about, you know, uh, you know the message or, or what are we teaching our guys. They're just kind of chasing money uh some of these get these kids and uh you know i certainly understand that in some aspect but you wonder if that long term uh is that going to damage their career their legacy and even their their ability to graduate uh and move on so i don't have the answers to it i just know that uh you know i hope something's done because it's really kind of you know, if you even look at the money that's being thrown around this year as it compared to like, you know, the year before, I think it's a lot more. And what will it be like next year at this time? Will it even be more? And how do we compete uh, with that? Right. And, and and it's not just Mac schools, like you said, it's it's bigger schools as well. Even Rutgers lost a couple of players this year, probably for, for NIL reasons. So it's impacting across the board. You look at some guys in the conference who who transferred out um and transferred up i should really say nowadays when in this in this environment when you may only have a player for one or two years how much of a focus is it for you and your coaching staff to already be looking ahead to guys who are you know maybe even early high school years trying to get a jump on that yeah i certainly think it's tougher um yeah. you know for sure you know you, you you've got this whole thing Pete, where you, you say, okay, we're going to take a high school kid, and our job is now to get him better and to get him good and to make it. And when that happens, is he's just going to leave you anyway. Um, so I think roster management, every mid-major coach, every coach is really looking at that right now, how to manage your roster. If you take a transfer from another school uh, and say he's just completed his first year at this other school, well, you kind of know that you've got him for three years now. Yep. Uh, if you take a high school kid, you're not sure how long you're going to have him. Um, so you're trying to kind of, I think, build your roster with a combination of transfers, maybe a JUCO kid here and there, maybe a high school kid, and try to make it all work where you can manage manage that. Uh, in some sense, you're like an NBA GM where you're trying to figure out how many years a guy has left on his contract. Yep uh and and uh you know how to balance that so it's it's really way different than even three four years ago when, when i started the job here i thought okay we're just gonna kind of build it all with you know high school freshmen and, and retain them and and uh and and all that but it's the climate has completely changed jay you've casted your nets far for recruiting you know you're bringing in uh uh maruf mumine and then also barima sec Two guys who come from Africa, um, Maruf, highly touted, was visiting schools. You know, he, I think he had went on a visit to FAU, obviously, um, coming off of a Final Four appearance. NBA Academy product. What could you say about recruiting kids from from Africa? What could you talk? What can you say about their readiness, their physicality, especially when you see a guy like Adama Sanogo, who just absolutely don dominated the tournament as well. You know, also, uh, you know, from from Africa. Yeah, I don't think Peter was anything we we intentionally did. It just kind of came up where there were a couple connections with the NBA Academy uh, through through some people we knew, and and Maruf's name came in front of us, and we just kind of followed them and watched them. And with Barima, 
uh, there was a connection with a coach that I knew who really highly recommended him. So it wasn't anything intentionally that we wanted to do. They're both, um, uh, I will say this, Pete, you know, two tremendous kids um, who, you know, I think are really appreciative of the opportunity that they have at a place like Fairfield. So uh, Barima, who, we, who has been here all summer, has been just a joy to work with. And I'm really excited to get uh, Maroof back here. Look at the backcourt for a second. Um, you talk about Bleachmore, bring in, bringing in Bleachmore, and then also Jasper Floyd, who is a product of JUCO down at Hillsbury, Hillsborough Community College in Florida, averaged 14 points a game there this year, two years of eligibility remaining, smooth lefty. What could you say about his game? Yeah, Jasper's been a, a strong addition. Um, we, we were looking for a guy kind of like uh, in the Taj Benning mold, the really physical guard who could uh, play a couple positions, could play on and off the ball, and uh, could kind of defend – uh, on the perimeter, I thought, you know, last year we kind of missed Taj's uh, perimeter experience, especially defensively. Uh, and uh, Jasper is, is, you know, physically ready to play in, in really any league. He, he's, uh, you know, 6'2", really strong, uh, great body, uh, great worker, uh, high character kid. So we kind of wanted to clone Taj and bring him back and Jasper is what we kind of came up with and um he's been like I said a really strong addition to our team and and uh you know can play the point guard position I think he can guard you know certainly one through three um and in his uh you know like his, uh, a really high level character kid so I've, I've been you know, thrilled with with having him in the program. If anybody knows Jay Young, they know that he's out in the community too. He likes to be around people. Right now, you got a camp going on on campus, youth camp, the Jay Young basketball camp. So three weeks of basketball camp. What has that looked like on the campus of uh, Fairfield University? It's been a ton of fun. And our guys work the camp, do an unbelievable job with the kids. Uh, I said, I think if you want to, see the definition of chaos come over around noon at lunchtime when our camp is in there and all the other camps that are going on at Fairfield University. But uh, honestly, we sold out for week one at 187 campers, and uh, I think we got close to 140, I think a big third week too. So it's been great. And uh, uh, I think our guys, our players might have more fun than the campers. They really get into it. I got to calm them down sometimes and tell them that they're, you know, not moving on to the NBA if they win the camp cha championship, but but it's been great. And earlier this summer, you were a part of a uh, fundraising effort along with Coach Anthony Latina at, at Sacred Heart. You guys were involved in in a breakfast discussion, uh, a little roundtable type of event. You guys raised money for the Hall Neighborhood House in Bridgeport. What could you say about that event and having a great turnout um, that morning? Yeah, it was awesome. Uh, and if, if anybody hasn't uh, familiarize themselves with what the Hall House does. They they do tremendous work for the community in Fairfield, uh, um, Fairfield and Bridgeport. Uh, but uh, it was a great event. Uh, they had Coach Calhoun was the speaker last year. So Coach Latina and I were very nervous that this could be only a fundraiser that loses money. <laughs> but uh, and, uh, for a tremendous cause, uh, we had a lot of fun up there uh, talking basketball and talking about our rivalry. So, uh, want to thank the Hall House for having us. Jay, it's been a pleasure having you on. You're always welcome on here. Thanks so much for your insights. I wish, you know, the best of luck to you and the Stags in this upcoming season. And it's going to be a fun season in the MAC. So uh, I, I think we should all buckle up. I appreciate you having me.